Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis, um, <clears throat> not our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium as planned. It's our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Remind our internet viewers that questions, comments can be submitted to us at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And for those here in-house, we ask that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin the program. It's especially helpful when the speaker remembers to do that. <laughs> uh, we will post the program within 24 hours on our website for everyone's future reference as well. Our books are available in the lobby and following Dr. Wurzel's remarks, we will have him signing copies and we will do that here in this room at the panel table for our continued conversation with him then. Hosting our event is Walter Lohman, director of our Asian Studies Center. He previously served as senior vice president and executive director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. He was also the council's country director at representing American interest in Indonesia and Singapore. He has served on the professional Republican staff for a ranking Senate Foreign Relations Committee member, as well as a policy aide to Senator John McCain. Please join me in welcoming Walter Lohman. Walter? Thanks, John. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I, uh, I didn't know Larry was this popular, but uh, it's a pretty extraordinary turnout for a book launch. Um, I also want to specifically welcome Sally and Doug Lilly, um, Ambassador Lilly's uh, wife and son. He was, uh, Ambassador Lilly was probably the most widely respected person in any field I can imagine. You know, one person that kind of dominates a field respected across the political spectrum. Um, it's really a, an honor to have you here representing his legacy in that regard. Um, I, um, I'm going to be brief here about Larry's book. He's going to talk about it. It always seems kind of silly to give much, uh, much uh, commentary at the outset. Um, the book jacket hits the highlights of his uh, career. I guess that's what book jackets are supposed to do. Uh, that's what publicists are paid for. Um, 32 years in the military, two stints uh, in Beijing in that regard um, as military attache, uh, director of Strategic Studies Institute at U.S. Army War College. Um, he's also spent a decade on the, um, on the uh, U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission, uh, where he's had a lot of day-to-day -day exposure on all of these, on all of these matters. Um, most importantly, maybe, for me anyway, uh, Larry is one of my predecessors in, in this job as uh, director of the Asian Studies Center here. He's also vice president for foreign policy uh, at, the, at the Heritage Foundation. And not on the book jacket, of course, is that he has been a mentor to me, especially when I first came into this job trying to get my bearings or, or reestablish my bearings on China. He was, he was extraordinarily helpful and continues to be uh, important counsel for me as I, as I go about my own job. Um, as, as long as I'm, I'm talking about the book jacket to his book, The Dragon Extends Its Reach, uh, I want to point out the endorsements on the back, because that was the thing that first grabbed my mind. Again, a publicist's job, right, uh, to, uh, to, to highlight uh, some opinions of influential people. But um, the two that jumped out at me were Rich Armitage, who calls it a must-read for current and inspiring China hands, and, um, and Denny Blair who calls it an ins indispensable guide to the People's Liberation Army. Uh, those two people I, I point out because they're not sort of our, our usual fellow travelers on these issues. They're not usually um, or very often in this room at a heritage program and that sort of thing. I think it's really important to point out the broad credentials that, that Larry brings and the wide, uh, wide respect that he commands among the, the China um, China military analyst community because um, sort of a game that goes on in Washington, if any of you have been involved in China issues very long, you're well aware of it, um, which is to sort of, there's a tendency to marginalize people. You don't like their views too much. And uh, many of the people in the community, Americans, kind of play into that sometimes. Uh, so I think it's really important that Larry has gotten uh, such wide, uh, widely respected people to endorse his, his uh, research. And that's what they're endorsing. They're not necessarily endorsing his conclusions. And Denny Blair makes that point in, in his, uh, his remarks. But they're endorsing the quality um, and the rigor of his research. I think that's a very important thing. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Larry. He'll tell us some things about the book. We'll take some, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Walter. It, it's a real pleasure to be back at Heritage, and I, I appreciate uh, you all coming today. I have to be very careful because my wife said she's going to watch it on the live stream. You won't see her, Sally, <laughs> but, but I have to watch my words. Um, it, it, it's great to be back at the Heritage Foundation, uh, probably one of the best jobs I ever had. And, and Walter's job as Asian Studies Center Director, I have to say, was a lot more fun in a lot of ways than Vice President because uh, there's a lot of flexibility. And, and Sally and uh, Doug, thank you for coming along very much. There, there are so many scholars and journalists in the audience that uh, I have deep respect for. I've learned from their writing. I've learned from their research. Uh, and and I, I tried to carry some of these ideas through. As I wrote this, I won't mention everybody by name. Uh, but I want to start, if I can, with one of the concluding thoughts in the book, because I, I think they really frame the irony of the bilateral relationship uh, between the United States and China. And that's there, there's just this deep incongruity between the level of economic engagement and the level of trade between our two countries or the two countries and the military posture of each country. Uh, it, it, it sometimes is incomprehensible to me that you, you would get yourself into a situation where, uh, at least for China, they see us as the greatest potential threat and enemy. Uh, and, and we've got whole strategies to combat what we're afraid they might do, that you end up in this close bilateral relationship. Now, I, I, I think the level of this sense or perception of threat is different for each of us. My, uh, a, a guy I used to deal with from the, the PLA intelligence department a lot in China is an older, uh, retired uh, military attache used to call me aside and say, you have to think of it as Tianzaidawisha, a latent potential threat, not an actual threat. He says, so don't, don't be so sharp or so hard on us. It's only potential and latent. But, but it really is the way things are. Uh, what alarmed me as I was doing research for this, and I'd get into China about once a year and buy a lot of the new books that the PLA was publishing and read all their journals, is that Chinese military planners really seem convinced that their most likely enemy and their greatest potential threat is the United States. They have a lot of other concerns. Things aren't great with Russia, even though they buy a lot. Things are a lot worse with Japan. Uh, but, but they focus on us and they focus on our technology. Uh, and, and part of what's driving that force posture for China is a, a global, uh, I'll, I'll use the acronym, then I'll explain it, C4ISR architecture, command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And I have, uh, I, I, in a very strange way, the, the, the central, the second chapter of the book, the central thing, really focuses on that. Because without that knowledge architecture and that communications architecture, you can't have a global military. You, you can't achieve that goal. Uh, so what they did uh, was essentially watch how we handled the war in the Balkans. They watched how we handled the uh, uh, war in Iraq, the wars in Iraq. Uh, and they read everything, literally everything the United States published on the topic, and used that as a model. Now, what's impressive to me is uh, 
they figured out that they, they, they've got dual goals. One is to have their own architecture that allow them to see what's going on and to project force uh, out into the Pacific, but also in different places around the world. But they also understand that we are very dependent on that architecture and that uh, they want to deny the U.S. Abil the ability to operate freely near China and then they want to support their own military activities uh, out into the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and even to Africa. Now, Mike Pillsbury walked in. I said I wasn't going to name everybody here, but, but I'm going to name Mike. I'm glad you came because for, for I, I, I have, if you don't know Pillsbury's writing, he has the ability to pick really salient articles and and let the Chinese speak for themselves. Not many people can do that. Uh, and that's what I tried to do, is, is to at least use that style, because I think Mike has done a superb job at that. But he also, for a number of years, harassed me, saying, you got a couple of monographs that you really ought to think about a book. So thank you, Mike. <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, it, one of the more serious things, uh, I, I've got chapters in there on space warfare, nuclear and missile doctrine, and information warfare. I, I think the important thing to consider is that People's Liberation and Army doctrine really calls for paralyzing attacks on the United States and our overseas bases in case of conflict. And then chapter eight in the book really talks about that, and it, and it discusses electronic warfare and what the Chinese are calling, calling integrated network electronic warfare. As I said, they, they watched what we did, they read, read our stuff. Now up through about, I think, about 2001, 2002, if you read Chinese military journals, and, they pretty much quoted us. But after that, they began to develop their own doctrine uh, that's more suited to their force structure and to the level of education of some of the people. And they don't do it exactly like we do. But now, when you read, since about 2007, if you read a Chinese book or article, they're citing their own stra strategic thinkers and authors. And I think that's important because there's a certain amount of innovation going on there. The other thing that I, I find both impressive and, and a little scary is they have combined traditional electronic warfare with what boils down to uh, Soviet radio electronic combat. Now, now the, the Soviets, the Russians had this very effective military doctrine, fortunately, we never had to test it, that combined electronic warfare, radio direction finding, intelligence collection, uh, and jamming with precision strikes by artillery, rockets, aircraft, and attack helicopters. Well, it, it, in the book I call it radio electronic combat on Chinese steroids because the, the innovative part that the Chinese have added is they've taken it to the strategic level. Remember this Russian doctrine was intended for Europe, right on the East European, West European border. And they've added in attacks in space and against satellite systems, anti-satellite warfare, cyber warfare, and attacks on the critical infrastructure of uh, a potential enemy where they would paralyze ports and paralyze airports and, and shipping and movements. So it's, uh, it's highly escalatory. It's not the kind of thing you're going to do uh, unless you're really at war, and we don't know what might kick that off. But it is a zero-hour action. It's meant to paralyze an enemy, and, and, and that, is, uh, that is their doctrine. Uh, I want to back up a little bit, too, because uh, one of the things I tried to accomplish, and this is really in the first chapter, was to infuse the book with a little sense 
of the history of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and how it understands itself. And then I tried to continue that through some of the other chapters. Because the early history and uh, culture of people's war, uh, of involving the civil population, it is really still reflected in contemporary Chinese military doctrine. If you look at how a theater of war, a, a John Chu mobilizes uh, for exercises or in case of conflict, uh, they, they bring in professors from universities that have special skills. It involves uh, people in industries that can do depot repair and maintenance on equipment, uh, civilian technicians inside the area, and they even bring them in from outside. They, they recruit civilian hackers to do some of the things they, they need done. A and these people get incorporated in the Chinese military force structure in times of crisis. And remember, it's still you know, kind of a tightly controlled authoritarian one-party state. So if they tap you on the shoulder and say, Gee, Walter, you're pretty good at uh, repairing uh, heavy armor vehicles. You've been working on buses, but uh, not this year. That's going to happen. You're going to go do that. Uh, I, I, and I, I think it's important to understand that. Uh, it, and also in terms of operational concepts, I, I have a, a table on pages 90 to 93 in the book that compare some of Sunzu's concepts on military operations, Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, uh, uh, on military operations, to Mao Zedong's operational instructions to his field armies during the Huai Hai campaign, which I think was 1948, am I right? Yeah. Uh, and, and you'll see, I, I try to walk them back and forth to show that a lot of these earlier concepts of what a military does and how they do it uh, get continued there. And then uh, I, I leap forward, I think it's pages 94 to 97, you can see how these evolve into contemporary PLA operational concepts. Uh, there are continuities. Uh, some of using the indirect approach, uh, striking the enemy's center of gravity, using surprise, deception, and preemption, not new military concepts, familiar in Western military doctrine, uh, but they're all there. But, but new technologies have also driven new concepts for the Chinese military, like combining information warfare, electronic warfare, uh, missiles, space operations it, with precision fire power strikes. They call it soft and hard strikes. And there's also a discussion of asymmetric warfare that had a lot of currency for a while. Um, I, I, I don't find it magic. Uh, I mean, you know, I was a, a dumb grunt in the Marine Corps and they told me don't charge right into a machine gun, you know, try and hit it with aircraft or shoot it with other stuff. So, so I don't find that necessarily, uh, no military seeks to use direct attacks against the enemy's strongest points. But, but what the PLA has done is think through what the greatest weaknesses of some of their potential enemies are, like us in Japan, and, and, and attach them, uh, attack them in an asymmetric way. Uh, the, the term anti-access uh, area denial, or A2D2, uh, really, for China, is a counter-intervention strategy. And, and their, their history, I mean, if you're a kid in school in China, you're learning about a century of humiliation, where from the Opium War forward, you, you, China was sort of invaded, cut up into extraterritorial zones by foreign countries in their view. And uh, it, it, that really creates a certain level of paranoia that is reflected in this counter-intervention strategy. Now, it's a serious strategy. Uh, it involves submarines, mines, cruise missiles, air, new air and ship launch cruise missiles with longer ranges, uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles, 
their own C4 ISR architecture, uh, combat aircraft that have a far longer reach that are supported now by airborne electronic uh, and early, early warning aircraft, the AWACS aircraft, and over the horizon radars. But uh, I guess De Denny Blair's uh, critique is a, is a good one that he, he thinks sometimes I, I, I give them too much credit uh, for too many capabilities and some of these things remain theoretical and doctrine. Uh, but the fact is they do have limitations uh, and I discuss these in there. They can't produce a decent uh, jet aircraft engine. They still can't do it. Their metallurgy won't let them do it and something that, so other things. Uh, quality control. Their naval propulsion systems are really pretty bad. Uh, they can't do a tank engine. They're still buying them from elsewhere. Uh, so that uh, that drives the cyber espionage and the human espionage and the reverse engineering that we see out of China's military. Uh, it, and and I have a short discussion on some moves the United States has to take uh, to reinforce the fact that our allies who are selling loads of military technology to China really uh, potentially hurt U.S. security by doing that. And, and Dennis, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the uh, 2005 act by Mr. Hyde that, uh, that really linked uh, allied sales to China with uh, participation in U.S. defense programs. Because you gotta force those allies to make a business decision. You wanna make a few hundred grand on China or take part in a you know, 10 or 15 billion dollar program in the United States, and Mr. Hyde's uh, legislation did that. And it stopped the European Union uh, from uh, ending the arms embargo after the, that was put into place during the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, now, Hu Jintao's uh, speech in, I think it was December 24th, 2004, on the historic missions of the PLA, I, I, I think is seminal. Uh, Dan Hartnett's got a couple of good things out on it. Because what he did was say, uh, you, you got to do more than just keep the Communist Party in power and keep people from dissenting in China and protect the borders and the near seas. You, you have to become a more expeditionary military. And, and that's, I, I try to capture in the title, the PLA has to be ready to protect sea lines of communications. He pointed out that China has really deep uh, and distant economic and national interests around the world, and, and he looks for a PLA that can really expand itself, develop itself, and, and do those sorts of things. Xi Jinping came along with the China's dream vision and that agenda really, uh, as I see it, it, it tells the PLA, be ready to expand. China's gonna be a great power. And, and I think uh, the, the People's Liberation Army and its Navy have learned a lot in the past the few years. Their, their task force in the Gulf of Aden, I think they're on their 12th or 13th task force out there now, has really uh, taught the Navy uh, that it needs combat logistics support at sea, which allows it to be a, uh, a Navy that can project itself. And it's taught PLA Navy commanders that, you know, you're not always gonna be able to go back to the Central Military Commission every time you have to make a decision or to the military region headquarters, the John Chu headquarters. You, you, you have to, at times, think for yourself. A and that's somewhat new in their system. And, I think they're very happy with what's happened so far. The evacuation from Libya that they had to conduct involved their civil aircraft fleet, military aircraft, uh, uh, civil ships, and one of those ships from the task force in Aden. A and that showed them, uh, first of all, that they needed to be a more expeditionary force, uh, 
uh, and hostage problems primarily in Africa showed them that they needed at least a limited forced insertion capability. And, and you, see, you can see that beginning to evolve, and I, I emphasize beginning to evolve. But one of the things I learned from all this research is if you go through enough articles from Chinese universities by scholars, uh, you, you really see the guts of what some of the new ideas and doctrine are going to be. I, I'll never forget a, a P People's Liberation Army conference up at Carlisle, Pennsylvania a few years ago, and, and I talked a little bit about the development of this uh, anti-ship ballistic missile, and I'll tell you that the Navy guys there just dumped all over me. They told me I was smoking dope, that, that this would never happen. <laughs> But I had been reading articles in Chinese academic journals for about two years that had algorithms that would allow a ballistic missile warhead to seek and find a moving ship. Now, I am not a mathematician. I could not tell you if those algorithms are right or wrong, but uh, that thing's fielded now, so I guess they were right. So you, you, you better not think it's going to take too long to achieve some of these new goals. They ran an air exercise in Turkey that involved sending a bunch of uh, aircraft, I think they used SU-27s, uh, over Iran for refueling, across a couple other countries, across water, ran uh, a, an air combat exercise with the Turks and came back. That teaches you how to run an expeditionary airfield. That teaches you what uh, combat logistics support you need for a deployed air unit. Uh, and, and their new naval exercises in, uh, up in the, uh, I guess it's the Yellow Sea and East China Sea uh, this week with the Russians are very interesting because uh, they're very politically correct. I mean, they're, they're termed anti-piracy exercises, which, which they are, but they have a limited forced insertion capability on the ships. Uh, without uh, really getting directly into Japan's interests. They send a message to Japan. Uh, so they're learning as they go along. Uh, the, uh, some of the other things that I, I think we need to pay attention to uh, and really uh, some of the things we don't know. I, I mean, a lot of what the Chinese military is doing is, is in my opinion, pretty transparent. You got to read a lot of Chinese books and articles, but if you can read it and even read some translations, you get a pretty decent picture of where they're headed. Uh, but and we can infer certain things from their doctrine. You can infer from their uh, space warfare doctrine, and Jim, how you doing? And their uh, from their uh, doctrine on cyber warfare and critical infrastructure attacks. That, that in case of conflict, they really mean to go after an enemy's homeland. Uh, so you can infer some things. But what is not really clear uh, is intention, what escalation ladder would trigger a conflict, and, uh, you know, we don't know how many ballistic missile nuclear warheads they have. The, 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 the Department of Defense and the, the intelligence community still holds it. I think it's 200, 240. Uh, the former head of the Russian Strategic Rocket Forces thinks they have 800 active and another 800 in reserve. The Taiwanese uh, think it's 600. The uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies you know, if you do the numbers, maybe about 400. But more seriously, the, the launchers now are all road mobile. And they're linked to this underground network of tunnels and entrances and exits uh, and even a rail system. So he, he, that complicates any targeting. It complicates early warning. Uh, some of the other concerns I think we should have are the, the idea of space warfare and blinding, really space control and what they call space deterrence fascinates the Chinese. A couple of Chinese authors are very clear 
that for a deterrent to be effective, you have to demonstrate it. Doesn't help if people just think you can do something. Well, over the past five or six years, they've dazzled and blinded a, uh, a U.S. satellite, uh, imaging satellite. They've knocked their own satellite out of space with a kinetic shot from China. They've launched constellations of uh, micro satellites that could jam or collide uh, with other satellites in space. A and that, too, is uh, <coughs> potentially escalatory because if you, I mean, we had a, a kind of a shared and tacit agreement with the Russians that you don't mess with space surveillance and warning assets because those are indications and warnings that hostilities are imminent. And the Chinese are not part of that conversation. Uh, so I, I think we must pay attention to that. Uh, I, I think I'll wrap it up there, yeah. Thank you, Larry. Uh, what are we, um, what are we opening up to questions? Uh, the audience, yes sir, right here. So we have a microphone for you. Please identify yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Segalin with the PBS NewsHour. Larry, what scenarios do the Chinese see as most likely existing for, for coming to war, for, for war with the United States? Well, they're, they're obviously their, their biggest bump uh, or foot drop is something over Taiwan. Personally, I, I don't think that necessarily is the biggest. I, I think it's more likely uh, going to be something over uh, their declarations of sovereignty. And I don't think it's highly likely. But it, it, the, the, their claims in the South China Sea and their East China Sea, their confrontations with allies like Japan, um, in my opinion, create a greater uh, possibility of flashpoints, uh, although Taiwan is there. If I could just follow up on that, but how are they uh, postured and equipped, and how do they plan? Are they still focused on Taiwan as a, as a force, or are they moving to a plan and equip for other? Teams? No, they, I, I think their 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 planning and their thinking uh, and their writing goes far beyond Taiwan as a scenario. I think they're pretty comfortable with the situation in Taiwan. I, I, I don't think that uh, they feel that. Uh, there is some imminent uh, sense of a declaration of independence there. And I think they're quite comfortable with the military balance, which, in my opinion, across the strait favors them. Other questions? Yeah, right here in the front. Uh, my name is Arnold Zeitlin. I teach in China. Is it, uh, it's working. Uh, is there any? Concern that you've noticed uh, among Chinese military thinkers about possible conflict with India? Uh, uh, you know, I, I actually just finished up a book chapter on that for Phil Saunders at the National Defense University. And I, uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, they're trying very hard to avoid that, that they have an overwhelming uh, nuclear capacity to deter that, uh, but that the most likely scenarios still remain the conflicts over the land border. Now that, the Indians don't feel that way. And, and I had sent chapters out to a lot of retired Indian uh, flag officers and, and generals, and uh, even uh, when we discussed my draft, uh, I was criticized by some for not putting enough emphasis on potential naval conflict. But, but quite frankly, I, I stuck with what I concluded. I just don't see it. I think the likelihood of a major conflict remains relatively low. And I think the most volatile area is the land border. And, and the, the Indian Navy and military is not growing at the same speed or pace. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Lin from Senator Angus King's office. And my question is, well, one of the major weaknesses in the Chinese military right now is anti-submarine warfare. And do you see them trying to remedy, remedy it either by 
sort of unconventional means like mo naval mines or sort of broad-based spectrum of building uh, anti-submarine wa warfare aircraft and the like? Actually, they may in some ways be doing better than us in anti-submarine warfare. I mean, we have an awful time finding their submarines. Uh, but they have moved toward unmanned undersea vehicles. Uh, uh, they have, uh, I, I, I believe, are moving toward um, submarine-launched cruise missiles. Uh, so so I, I think uh, towed arrays, uh, all their helicopters that come off destroyers, lift off the destroyers now, have data links that would allow them to coordinate with over-the-horizon radar, with uh, the, the get data from satellites, feed it back in. Uh, I, I, I couldn't talk about how the balance is, but I have more concerns about the U.S. abilities in the anti-submarine warfare. I mean, they, they did manage to surface right behind the U.S. aircraft carrier. And they had no idea the Chinese were there. Hi, uh, Will Sheffram, also work in the U.S. Senate. Um, my question is, uh, you've, you've, we've heard some uh, conversation about the Chinese trying to establish some sort of, uh, I guess, overseas military bases, small installations in the Indian Ocean, um, possibly Southeast Asia. How reliable are those reports, and do the Chinese really have any desire to uh, extend their, at this time, um, extend their military footprint to outside of their own borders? Well, they've learned that they have to have places, as the way we phrase it, that they need places that they can go to reliably for repairs, for refueling, uh, for food. And I, I think they're establishing that sort of network, certainly around the Gulf of Aden and all the way out to it. Uh, it they, I, I mean, their foreign policy doctrine is that they will not establish overseas bases. Uh, but I don't, what I don't see are garrisoned forces uh, anywhere, except when you look at Gwadar and Pakistan, and if you look at Burma, they certainly have installations that could turn into that very quickly. Uh, so the, the chain of pearls uh, theory may be, at this point, uh, still a chain of accessible places that may eventually get PLA logistics offices, but I just don't see the basis that, that we traditionally had. In the back. Right in the orange. Uh, thank you. We're from the uh, Voice of America Memory Service. Sure. So I have a question that is, uh, you know that in April, China has released its first military force white book called the uh, Diversified Employment of China's Armed Force with all the uh, details of the ground and air and navy force. So uh, do you think this is a signal that Chinese military power is ready to go global? And uh, also in this um, ongoing annual US-China strategy and economic dialogue, so do you have any expectations, in, especially in the military uh, aspects and field? Thank you. Uh, I, I was not impressed at all by their latest white paper. I, I, I think uh, you will learn more about China from the International Institute of Strategic Studies as a military balance. I, I think it, it really uh, was not that revealing. I, I mean, it, it's kind of useful as a restatement. These things started as a confidence building measure with ASEAN. I'm glad to see them continue but I did not think that it was uh, terribly helpful or uh, revealed a lot. I uh, certainly didn't talk about intent. Uh, w with respect to second part? Uh, S&ED. Uh, S and and by the I, way, just in that, in that same context, what about the other mechanisms, S&ED and other things? How are they serving to help clarify uh, intentions? And sure. I, I think the S&ED and other confidence building and security mechanisms are, are, are very useful as a, a dialogue where senior leaders can understand each country's concerns, each other's concerns, and understand what actions might be escalatory. I don't expect much out of the S&ED. The Chinese are trying to 
use the cyber talks to close the internet. I mean, they're still concerned about domestic security. Russell? Um, Russell Shell with Project 2049. Um, Mr. Russell, thank you for this excellent book. Um, I was particularly struck by chapter nine <laughs> of your book on the general political department and information operations because this is the only non-kinetic sort of component right. of military power that was that your, fo your book focuses on. So I was wondering maybe if you could elaborate really how you think the Chinese see this uh, general political de department and, and its associated activities and operations as it fits into how it, you know, of, Chinese military power going global. How does it tend to use this and how does it fit into the overall sort of structure? Well, thank you for the question. And Russell, I, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of you guys at 2049. Your work's great. And chapter eight reflects it pretty heavily. <laughs> um, the, the, w when I saw this uh, three warfares theory from the general political department, my initial reaction was to say, okay, these guys don't have anything to do. They came up with this new theory to make the general political department look relevant. But then when you read it, uh, they're very serious about this idea of legal warfare. Uh, the idea is that you stake out positions early in international law that would justify your military actions and that could be used in the international community to attack the in law and, and legal terms and in terms of common uh, international practice, attack the actions of any potential enemy. And it's quite clever. And they've got a lot of articles and doctrines and statements on that out there. Uh, and, and one of the points I make is we don't do that. You know, if you go to the Army War College or the Air War College, you don't find Air Force and Army legal scholars shaping arguments now that might counter these Chinese arguments about sovereignty in space or uh, at sea in the future. So I, I do think we need to do that. But surprisingly, they, they learned it from us. They, they thought that the way we justified allied actions in the Balkans and the first Gulf War uh, in the United Nations and the international legal community was a model for what they want to do. Yeah, it's interesting. They have a at sea, anyway, they have a, a slight problem in that regard. Is that there there are bodies to adjudicate right. law, and they they they're not keen to have those they, bodies. They, they want to adjudicate avoid that. it. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. I, I think that if if the Japanese uh, go the uh, I think it's the Hague on uh, on the Senkakus, the Chinese will refuse to participate. Well, and so far the Filipinos have taken yeah. to arbitration. They have picked up. Mike, you had a question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there it is. I have a question about our mentor and former boss, Ambassador Jim Lilly. Um, as you know, the Chinese press has attacked Jim Lilly a lot over the years. They also attacked you and me by name one time as the two Americans who most have it in for China. And sometimes <laughs> they link us to Jim Lilly as though he was t giving us these instructions. Um, I was always very proud of this criticism. But Jim Lilly, in his preface to a book I think both of us had an article in a long time ago, used the word vicious. There's a vicious debate, he said, inside the United States about the Chinese military, both intentions and capabilities. He later on, at a, at a talk at the NDU we were both at, talked about the climate change debate in America has two sides. Right. The abortion debate has two sides. People know where they stand. They know what the issues are in, in conflict. But I notice in your book, and I criticize myself for this too, you ignore the other side. I've done that. It takes a lot more time. But when PBS NewsHour has a story about your book. They're here. Be careful. I know. I see Dan back there. <laughs> when they have a story about your book, they're going to invite somebody from the other side to sit there and chew up 10 minutes attacking you and why everything you say is wrong. And the Chinese press is going to attack you as well, that this book is just a China threat theory. So my, I, I have a question. Jim Lilly used to say, why don't we all write about the debate and try and do a point-by-point -point rebuttal so that outsiders could see what the issues are? 
I have failed Jim Lilly's request. I haven't done it yet. Are you going to fail him too? I, I, <laughs> well, I, I, I sure owe a lot of uh, my education and training to Jim, and, and uh, not only on China, but on leadership in general. But I, I think that that really deep, bitter debate has shifted to a certain extent, and I think it's shifted partly because of what Jim would, would make us do. You know, he, he, would, he would come in to me and say, you don't have so-and-so on this list to come to the, PL, the, the People's Liberation Army Conference. And I said, well, you know, he's kind of a pain in the butt, and he just argues. And Jim would say, you have to have him there. He says, it's going to take, it may take decades to shift these opinions, but, but you have to have them. So, I, I don't think, uh, I, I mean, the debates are kind of fun, but uh, I, I think that the, the people that would argue that it's a benign Chinese military that is purely out to defend itself are very few today. And, and, and it's only the fringes that, that really uh, don't realize that this is a very different military, the, you know, a federation of, a, of American scientists, uh, the uh, arms control people, I call them fringes. Uh, other people may think they're serious, but, uh, so I, I, I didn't feel a need to do it, and um, I, I, I don't know how useful it is, because I think the audience that we're trying to approach as we make these arguments, are, it, it, if you can, as you do, let the Chinese military speak for itself and document what you say, it's very hard to refute. And since, I, since I've been in this job, say, six years, I, I think the spectrum has shifted. Yeah. I mean, there's not very many people left on the side that we want to rebut. There's the Chinese embassy, <laughs> you know, uh, but there's not many other people over there uh, anymore. Uh, not to, not to uh, dismiss the, the need for it, but just to And, and, and even in China, I'm going to come a minute ago, and, and even in China it shifted for a few years. My, you know, my, my carnet, my Chinese diplomatic card was Wu R. It's a, it's a Wu Qi de Wu, Ni R, right side R, and Mao Zedong de Zhe. When the Chinese press didn't like me, they would use the Wu either for a crow or for dirty and filthy. <laughs> when they repeated uh, an article from Defense News a few weeks ago, uh, Xinhua used Dui Wu to Wu, uh, you know, the uh, military ranks, uh, a Ren and a Five. So it's, maybe they're getting better. <laughs> yeah, more flattering. Gord, I, I, Gordon, Gordon's yeah. had his hand up. Uh, Gordon Chang, I'm a writer. Larry, you talked about how the aid and anti piracy patrols have helped the Chinese learn how to deploy overseas and de project force. And you also talked about the joint uh, China-Turkish air exercises, mm -hmm. the same thing helping the Chinese Air Force. Uh, the question is, what type of engagement should we have with the Chinese military going forward? Uh, you know, I, I really spend the part of the closing of that book making that argument and, and use a, an old Heritage lecture as the basis of it uh, from when I first got to Heritage. Uh, but I, I, I think that it is still useful uh, to do things uh, that will promote uh, safety at sea. Uh, I, I actually think we should be doing things, not only at sea but in space, that would allow the mutual rescue of underwater submariners or um, uh, people in spacecraft, I, I think we should coordinate on those things. I think we can do that without giving away the store. Uh, I, 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 I think the, the dilemma is they're very good intelligence collectors, and as you operate in their proximity, you have to use very good operation security because now they're capable of collecting your signatures uh, of your propellers and your radio communications and actually using them in targeting. But if you pick the right ships and you pick the right programs, I think some things are useful. My caution is never do anything that will help the People's Liberation Army further repress or kill the domestic population. Uh, 
never do anything that will increase their capacity to threaten Taiwan or our allies or our own forces. Hi, Larry. Uh, Hunter Grimes from the Department of State. Uh, traditionally, when people talk about Chinese military modernization, they, they speak of it in terms of the equipment modernization, you know, where they've come from, where they are now, how far they can go, what they can blow up when they get there, and how well they can control all that sort of thing. And all that is true, but commensurate with that is, is growing institutional influence in larger foreign policy matters. Uh, you've mentioned the 2004 historical missions a number of times. The way that it was framed was not just your ability to go abroad for the sake of going abroad, but uh, your ability to protect Chinese growing national interests abroad. Um, to that end, how well and how do you see the, uh, the Chinese uh, foreign policy uh, bodies being able to integrate and, and accommodate the PLA's views overseas? I, I think that, first of all, the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee are going to, you know, handle uh, that debate in China, and they will set the limits and the direction of what goes on. It's still a party army. But, um, I mean, if I had to look five to ten years out, I, I think you're going to see something like what the French can do today. Nothing like what the English did with our help in the um, Falklands. Uh, something like what the, the, the real Soviet Eastern fleet was able to do. Uh, uh, you know, a, a float. I mean, their LPDs, their landing platform docks, are they're pretty effective. I mean, their, their amphibious force is, is going to be pretty effective. Uh, their airborne forces, I've jumped with those guys, and they're very good airborne troops, but they're still not doing mass drops. So you're going to see, I think, the ability to have task forces that will look something like the Australians or, you know, a, 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 I'm, I'm an old Marine, so it would be a battalion. I don't even know what Marine Corps calls it today. But a battalion landing team supported by a few aircraft and supported by helicopters and landing ships. I don't think it's going to be massive. That's not what's going to invade Taiwan. It's going to come the 90 miles over the street. I think this is going to be our last question, so okay. we can have some time for books here. Uh, I'm David Lai from the uh, Strategic Studies Institute of the Army War College. Um, Really, thank you for the presentation, and I think your book is a timely and, and must be a thought-provoking one. I have not um, finished reading the whole book. I'm going to buy one and finish that anyway. Um, I think you um, probably have addressed this issue, but you did not mention that in your opening with Mark, and uh, you just addressed that in passing uh, in these questions uh, as well. Uh, it looks like the, the title kind of suggests that the Chinese are uh, up and coming in its global reach. And the way as you analyze it uh, also kind of reinforce that, um, uh, that uh, aspect as well. So then the question is then, how, how would you see this uh, expanding, outreaching Chinese military in the future? Uh, not very far. Not very far. Um, and with respect <coughs> to the United States military presence all over the world, would, that, would they be um, like, be like us? Uh, would they be happy to be side by side with us? Or would that be a change of guards? Um, and then, uh, I think you are lucky you are, you are now no longer with the, the army anymore. Because the army today asked the question, that what should the United States military yeah. in general and the army in particular um, respond or react properly to this up and coming Chinese military. So I, I, I don't know if you address these issues in your book, uh, but it will be good to hear you uh, hear it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think, I, I think there will remain a competition between the two of us and their military will, will be used to build influence and help uh, influence arms sales uh, and, and things like that. I, I think they are global already in 
obviously in nuclear uh, and ballistic missiles, in space, and, and in cyber. I mean, and there's a war going on in cyber r right now. So they're already global there. Uh, I, I think you, you will see uh, if their doctrine holds true, the, the capacity to deploy ships outside bastions close to the coast that can actually hold ports of the U.S. Uh, ports, uh, em, uh, embarkation ports at risk uh, if it ever came to a conflict. But, but I think a part of it is going to be, uh, it may not be the Great White Fleet, but it's going to be the Chinese fleet that also helps uh, build uh, friendships uh, with countries that they think are of value to them. Uh, that will be capable of conducting non-combatant evacuation exercises. And what we didn't talk about here are the ground forces. I think if you, if you are a country on China's border, the ground forces are a lot better, uh, but they always were pretty lethal. So you still have to worry if China decides they're not happy with a border situation. Um, I'll leave it there. All right. Well, let's uh, let's leave it there. Thank you, uh, Larry, for you. briefing you on our book, on your <laughs> book, and uh, I hope you all will buy one. And if you do, bring it back, and Larry will sign it. Thank you.